today, I'd like to hear specifically from you what your thoughts are as it relates to Legacy City. I'd like to hear that in the context of the Marshall Plan, more specifically the Urban Marshall Plan. I'd also like to hear um, as it relates to Senator Clyburn's bill, why is that a bill that you can get behind? Good. Thank you. Other comments or questions? You know, let me just start out. What would you like? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, my name is Carol McCready. I'm a retired English teacher here in the city of Gary um, and an activist. Um, we have, I believe, a 40% unemployment rate in the city of Gary. Um, our young people don't have uh, the kinds of options that they need to have. We have very few uh, job training money. Uh, local hiring is always a problem for many reasons. And I wanted to know from your point of view, when you were elected, what kinds of policies would you have in place that would allow cities like ours to receive large amounts of job training dollars and, and also reinvestment dollars in our community? Do I hear that you just said youth unemployment here is 40%? Unemployment overall. Unemployment overall. Yes. And youth unemployment is probably higher than that would be. Okay, uh, yes, sir. Good morning, Senator. Uh, my name is Michael Caesar. This is my mom who works for the city, lifelong public servant. Uh, the Green New Deal is perhaps one of the most aggressive and robust pieces of legislation to address economic uh, and environmental injustice across the U.S. How will your administration prioritize that to deal with legacy rough belt cities like Gary that have experienced its fair share of racial, economic, and environmental injustice? Good. Okay, thank you, Michael. Other thoughts? Yes, uh, good morning. Tammy Davis with the City of Gary and Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the reinvestment of our schools. So I'd like to see from a national perspective, where can we go to invest in public schools to make sure that our kids are more competitive in this area of globalization? And then secondly, there's a lot of money being invested with infrastructure. And so where can we go as a municipality to ensure that our infrastructure is updated Good. and ready to compete at a global scale? Okay. Good. Yes, sir. Uh, Jerry Stiegel, I'm a uh, steel worker at uh, Arsenal of 
Snow. I uh, wanted to still work as local 1010. And uh, I, as the gentleman brought up the fact about the Green New Deal, which I think is very important. And a big part of that is the just transition for workers and communities. And uh, a good example is uh, locally here, uh, I think IPSCO finally realized the liability they had with these coal plants. And they're going totally renewable over a period of time. Uh, the problem is they're going totally renewable, but they didn't bring in the worker part of it. You know, the CEOs get a golden parachute when they leave. Now, what are the workers going to get? And there's no plan by NIPSCO to, and, and their transition to, to take care of the workers as far as any kind of severance or training and things like this. And, to, and they're also shifting out of the business, basically, because they're becoming a retailer instead of a producer. And uh, they're because they're going to buy all the renewable energy and they're just going to be the middleman and sell it to us. And they're going to, and then what's going to happen, the workers are going to phase out. So we have an issue with that with steel workers because uh, steel workers represent the NIPCO workers. And there's it's across the board, we represent the oil workers and, and, and things like this. So the people need to, the labor needs to get really involved in the, in the, in the Green New Deal. And I'm hoping that they'll jump on board and, and support your uh, path on that way. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Robert Campbell. I'm a community activist. And the things that I really stress and I see as being very important for here, in the city of Gary, and in the state of Indiana, is education. Education is key because education <coughs> is the passport to the future for this country. Thank you. How do we transition our young people that don't want to go to college into the trade? We have a lot of job opportunities that come to our city, but the first thing a lot of job um, employers will say that they're not qualified, they're not trained. So how do we get the training facilities put here inside of here for the jobs to come? All right. Uh, those are quite a set of questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Nathaniel Ross. I own a uh, private practice uh, you know, here in Gary, Indiana. And you know, the spirit of Medicare for All is all about patient access for everybody. But one thing that gets overlooked here in Gary is you know, <coughs> another form of patient access. It's the lack of physicians here. Lack of physicians. And you know, the problem is the, the reimbursement is so very poor. Uh, you know, for Medicaid. Effect, yeah, for, for, for Medicaid to affect the lack of physicians here. OK. Um, <coughs> the advantage of having a number of people make comments and ask questions and kind of lump them together. So you've touched on a whole lot of fundamental concerns. Let me just start off by saying something that I think is not said a whole lot. We are in the United States of America today the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Okay? So if I came before you and I said, well, you know, in America we're a poor country and we can't do this and we can't do that, well, that's not the truth. This is a country which a year ago gave a trillion and a half dollars in tax breaks to the top 1% and large profitable corporations, all right? We don't have the money to rebuild communities like Gary, really? Well, some of the major corporations in America last year, Amazon and others paid zero in taxes. We have enough money to spend on the military more than the next 10 nations combined. All right? So we are not a poor country when the three wealthiest people in America own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people. When 49% of all new income goes to the top 1%. So really what we are all talking about are what should the priorities be for America? Should they be tax breaks for billionaires and millionaires? Should they be spending huge amounts of money on the military? I don't think so, nor do I think most of you think so. So let me just deal with a few of the issues. Health again. We are the only major country, let me emphasize this because I think a lot of people don't know it. We are the only major country on earth that does not guarantee, underlying guarantee, health care to all people as a right. I live in Burlington, Vermont. 50 miles north of me is a country called Canada. In Canada, if you go, if you come down with heart disease or cancer, and you have to go under extensive therapy in a hospital in Canada, where you get quality care, anybody here know what the bill is? It's zero, not a penny. You go to any doctor you want to go to, you don't have to take out your wallet. 
That's not just Canada. In various forms, that's the UK, that's other European countries, that's Scandinavia, that's countries all over the world. All right, so number one, I believe that healthcare is a human right, not a privilege, and I thank the physicians. I thank the physicians who are here. So what Medicare for All says, that the function of our healthcare system is to guarantee healthcare to all, not make billions of dollars in profits for the insurance companies and the drug companies. And yes, 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 yes! And when we talk about healthcare in the United States, a lot of people don't know this. We are spending now twice as much per person on healthcare as do the people of any other country. Right now, you got a program called Medicare. And I think the elderly here in Gary and in Indiana are on that program. Our view is that over a four year period, we move toward providing Medicare for all. Right now, 65 years old, we bring it down to 55, then 45, we cover all of the children. It's not a radical idea. It exists in one form or another in every major country on earth. Okay, that's issue number one, healthcare. Issue number two, talk to the chief of money who is kind enough to walk with us. Everybody knows, and somebody correct me if you think I'm wrong here, is that when you have high unemployment rates for kids, kids will get into trouble if they don't see a future in front of them. All right? Nationally, we are now spending $80 billion a year locking up fellow Americans disproportionately African American, Latino, and Native Americans. $80 billion a year. What I believe from the bottom of my heart, from a human perspective, as well as an economic perspective, it makes a lot more sense to invest in our young people in jobs and education rather than more jails and incarceration. All right? I don't know what the numbers are in Indiana, but roughly speaking, we spend about $50,000 a year locking up somebody. $50,000 a year. That's a hell of a lot less than sending somebody to the University of Indiana. All right? So we gotta get our priorities right, and, and it's not that hard. What it says is that we are not going to allow kids to fall through the cracks. We're gonna have people there. You're thinking of dropping out of high school? Ain't gonna let you drop out of high school. We're gonna work with you. We're gonna get you a job. We're gonna get you an education. Having problems with your family, we're gonna deal with that. All right, which gets me to another issue, tied into everything else. And I know, again, what I am saying kinda of sounds radical, but we are the wealthiest country in the history of the world and we need a government that starts working for working people, not just large multinational corporations. Yes, right? yes! So here's an idea, not so radical. <clears throat> President, Roosevelt talked about it in the 1940s, and that is a guaranteed job for every American capable of working. Now, is that a radical idea? I don't think so. Just look around, not only this city, and I know this city faces challenges. Look at my state. Look all over this country. Think of the work that has to be done. All right? Every psychologist in the world, what will they tell you? They will tell you the ages of zero through four are the most important years of human development. Am I right? Yeah. All right. Intellectually and emotionally. You tell me about the child care system that exists in America today. All right. It is inadequate. It is unaffordable. And we pay the people who work with the kids who are doing some of the most important work in America, we pay them McDonald's wages. All right. So we're going to talk about universal child care so the kids get off to a good start in life. We're going to talk about strengthening public education in America. We're talking about making public colleges and universities tuition free. Now why is that so important? It's important not only if you are 18 years of age that are thinking about going to college, it is important if you are nine years of age because there are millions of kids in this country, in Vermont and in Gary, Indiana, who at a very early age catch on. They ain't never going to make it to the middle class their family is poor. They're never going to go to college. I believe that if we get the word out to parents and children, you do your homework, you study seriously, you know what? You are going to be able to get a higher education regardless of the incoming family. And you raised the question, a good question. 
Not every kid, for whatever reason, wants to go to college. Kids are good with their hands. We need the unions and we need others to engage in strong apprenticeship programs, again, tuition free. Give the unions and others the, the support they need so that we educate the young people, train them to be welders and carpenters and plumbers and do all of the work which pays really good wages, by the way, and is desperately needed. All right, we talked about infrastructure, we talked about the Green New Deal. So let me be very clear. And I say this in every speech that I give. Climate change is an existential threat to this planet. President Trump is dead, dead and dangerously dead. This impacts every state in America. This impacts every country in the world. China, Russia, India, Latin America. It impacts all of us. We are in this together. So what does it mean? It means that we need to transform our energy away, our energy system away from fossil fuel into energy efficiency and sustainable energy. That's the bottom line. And what the scientists tell us, we got 12 years to make that change before there is irreparable damage to the planet. What does that mean? How do you do that? For Assad, we need massive efforts at weatherization. My state, we have a lot of older buildings and it gets cold in Vermont. We have begun the process, not done enough, to put in the insulation, to put in the windows, to put in the doors, so that energy stays in the house, so it doesn't fly out, all right? Do you have any jobs, good union jobs, we can create all over America, weatherizing our homes, all right? We're talking about moving aggressively to wind and to solar and other forms of sustainable energy. More and more jobs, making sure that those products are built in the United States of America. We can build solar panels in the United States of America. We can build the products for wind turbines uh, in the United States of America. So you have an absolute existential need to transform our energy system. And when you do that, you're gonna create millions of jobs. You asked the right question. Some people are gonna be hurt in the transition. And there has to be, and we put into all of the legislation that we have supported to make sure that workers who lose their jobs are protected. Somebody who's working in the fossil fuel industry today trying to support his or her family is not my enemy. They need help in that just transition. And every legislation that I have supported has put many, many billions of dollars to make sure that those workers are protected and retrained, okay? We're talking about wages in America. I have long supported and we are making progress in raising the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. When we talk about wages, we talk about equal pay for equal work. Women should not be making 80 cents on the dollar. And women of color, women of color, uh, making even less. All right, you talked about a Marshall Plan, all right? And Clyburn's bill, which I am very sympathetic to. What that is about, Jim Clyburn is a uh, congressman from South Carolina, and he and I have been working on a, on a number of issues. And one of the issues, before I get to the so-called Marshall Plan, is um, do you have many uh, federally qualified community health centers here in? Okay. I work with Clyburn under the Affordable Care Act uh, to literally double funding for the community health center program. The result of that is many, many millions of people are now getting care. In the midst of a major health care crisis in which we've got 30 million people with no insurance and many more are underinsured, we are in the midst of a terrible crisis in terms of primary health care. We don't have enough doctors in cities and states and rural areas where we need them. So we have put substantially more money, I have to do it again, we're working on it right now, at the National Health Service Corps. Are you familiar with that program? And what the National Health Service Corps says, if you want to be a doctor and you're prepared to, or a nurse, or a dentist, dental issue uh, concern around here, affordable dental care, if you want to practice medicine or dentistry or whatever in an underserved area, you know what we're going to do for you? We're going to forgive your debts. All right? 
that begins the process of attracting doctors into underserved areas. Somebody raised the question about uh, the need for more black doctors, and that's absolutely true. Um, we do not have enough black doctors, enough black nurses, uh, or black health professionals. And that National Health Service Corps is one way I think we can help folks who don't have a lot of money uh, get the degrees they need to practice in a medically underserved area. Getting back to Clyburn's bill. What Clyburn is saying, which I think makes a lot of sense, is, and it's not just Gary, Indiana. It's not just even urban areas, it is rural areas. But some of you know that in the richest country in the history of the world, where in general, our life expectancy, how long we live, is below many other countries. Got it? All right. That has to do with the dysfunctional healthcare system and a lot of other factors. But that right now, for the third year in a row in America, our life expectancy is actually declining. You believe that? Actually going down. All right. So we got a major crisis, and that has to do with what the doctors call diseases of despair. All right, so when people have no hope, no matter whether you're black or white or Latino, you got no hope. You turn to drugs, you turn to alcohol, and tragically to suicide. All right? And that's what we're seeing in many parts of this country. So we gotta give people hope, and that means rebuilding communities. So what the essence of what uh, Clyburn's legislation is about it says, let us focus federal resources, 10% of federal resources, on communities which have uh, long-term, which have been distressed for a very long time, okay? So if you're living in a community which has a very high rate of poverty, which I assume is Gary, Indiana, yes? Yes. All right, and, and, and children's child poverty is very, very high. Where unemployment is high. Those are the communities, and they're urban and they're rural. We, we have got to focus our attention. That means we are gonna create an educational system. We understand that kids here are hurting. We understand that mostly their parents, like my parents, did not go to college. These kids need special help, I mean strong childcare. And we tie all of these things together by creating jobs. What about creating hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs, training people to be wonderful childcare? What about making sure that our teachers get a living wage, earn what they deserve, so that we attract, so that we attract the best of the brightest. I want the kids who are graduating college study to understand how important and gratifying education is teaching, going into the challenging schools. Many challenged communities see a high turnover rate of teachers, right? It's a tough place to work. We understand that. Give them the support that they need. Make public colleges and universities tuition-free to give parents the understanding that they're free. Well, I know that this is a so-called radical agenda. I understand. All right? And you know, when I talked about this four years ago in Indiana and in other states, everyone said, Bernie, you, you know, you're kind of crazy. You can't do all those things. But I want, I, I guess, to just convey to you that over a four year period, more and more Americans have come on board these ideas that we need to fundamentally change the priorities of this nation. That it's just not acceptable that so few have so much and the middle class is shrinking and 40 million people are living in poverty and sometimes dire poverty. Right? Children, it is not a radical idea to say that children, whether they're black or white or Latino, should not go hungry in the United States of America. This is America. It's not a radical idea to say that veterans should not be sleeping out on the street. So I guess the only point that I want to make in trying to summarize all of your comments and your questions, we are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. And if we stand together, and if we don't allow Trump or anybody else to divide us up by the color of our skin or where we were born, or our religion, or our sexual orientation, or whatever it may be. All of these ideas are ideas that the American people support. Right. Everybody in Vermont and in Indiana, they want their kids to get a good education. Who wants to turn on the water faucet in your house and uncover the fact that there's too much lead in the water and your child is being poisoned? Or that you got toxicity in your own community? Who wants that? 
So our job is to put the American people to work addressing these issues. Are we going to do it overnight or not? But can we do it? Can we focus on rebuilding those issues? Yeah. So I believe that we can. I believe that we can. And that's more or less what uh, my agenda uh, is about. And I have to conclude by saying this. Is I think that the great crisis that we face is not just economical, it's not just political, it is the issue of greed. And by that I mean you got people who have billions and billions of dollars in wealth. And then they come to Washington and they say, you gotta cut Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and education. I don't understand that. You got billions of dollars, why do you want to get more tax breaks on the backs of people who cannot afford the basic necessities of life. And we've got to take on that greed. We've got to take on that power. All right, I believe, and I've been working for Medicare for All for decades, how people believe that. Now. But if you think we are going to succeed without having the courage to take on the insurance companies, some guy at Aetna, think about this, guy at Aetna, one of the major insurance companies, negotiates a merger with CVS. Okay, a merger. She's going to drive up healthcare costs. You know how much this guy got for his work on the merger? Anyone want to guess? He got a bonus of $500 million. Do you think that that's where we should be sending our healthcare dollars? No. I mean, it's just, we are paying by far. Doctors, tell me if I'm wrong, the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Doctors in Vermont tell me they write out a prescription. One out of five people can't afford to fill that prescription. How crazy. Meanwhile, Top five drug companies made $50 billion in profit last year. So we got to stand up to that greed. And when you know I talk about my campaign, it is a grassroots effort, bringing people together to take on very powerful special interests. Sir? Yes, I'd be uh, remiss. I, I, I was hoping someone else would bring it up. But uh, uh, a thing that really bothers me is NAFTA. Uh, and that's something Good. that also addresses the uh, situation with uh, uh, drugs, but also this inequality in wages and the, and the system we've created uh, with this NAFTA, the current NAFTA agreement, all it is is legalized corporate slavery because uh, the wages in Mexico, the comparable jobs are probably 2 to $4 an hour. Yes, less than that. All right, look, you're looking at, and God knows this particular community has been hit hard by disastrous trade agreements. And that's what I mean by greed. So you have companies in America that weren't losing money here, but they can make more money by going to undeveloped countries where people are paid a buck or two bucks an hour. So you're looking at somebody who not only voted against NAFTA when I was in the House, but helped lead the effort. I was on the picket line with trade unions in opposition to NAFTA. <laughs> and opposition, you know, determining normal trade relations with China, but you're absolutely right. When we talk about an economy that works for everybody, it means fundamental changes in our trade agreements. So that these agree, trade is not a bad thing, but you need trade policies that work for working people and not just the profit margins of the large multinational corporations. All right, I think we probably, uh, any other questions or comments? Pardon me? Oh, hi, Mayor. Today I understand it's a busy day for uh, you. First and foremost, let me uh, say welcome to Gary, Senator Thank Sanders. We appreciate your um, willingness to stop here, but more importantly, we appreciate your highlighting of uh, issues of legacy cities. Um, you know, Gary is a legacy city, as you know. Detroit, you're on your way there as a legacy city. And what that essentially means is that we gave a lot to this country and we have been faced with a number of challenges. And the fact that you're here really indicates your willingness to highlight the issues that we face that are very similar to rural communities. Yep. And um, I've had extensive conversations with Congressman Cott Clyborne yep. about his plan. Good. I think it's a viable plan. It goes much further than opportunity zones. Yes. And, um, and so I just want to say thank you. I hope that as, um, and we know that uh, some of your colleagues are making announcements, even our neighbor to the east this weekend. And I hope that as we 
continue this discussion that domestic issues will remain um, as a major agenda topic. We understand the importance of national security, but we also understand the local needs, and uh, we appreciate your being here, and we know that your issues are the issues that so many of our citizens care about. Well, we've got a lot of media here as well. If it's okay with folks, can make the media ask a few questions up here? And any media questions out there? Please be loud, I can't, yeah. Uh, Senator Sanders, uh, you have come under scrutiny this week because you have taken on the millionaires and the billionaires, but you mentioned that you are a millionaire yourself now, <laughs> uh, having sold a popular book. Right. Uh, does that conflict with the message that you're pushing here to people here today? <laughs> I don't think so. I didn't know that it was a crime to write a good book. <laughs> it turned out to be a mess up. And my view has always been that we need a progressive tax system which demands that the wealthiest people in this country finally start paying their fair share of taxes. And if I make a lot of money, you make a lot of money, that is what I believe. So again, I don't apologize for writing a book that was number three on the New York Times bestseller, translated into five or six languages. Uh, and that's that. Uh, other question. My oh, by the way, by the way, this bothers me a little bit. Maybe we might want to talk about Gary, Indiana. Maybe we might want to talk about poverty. Maybe we might want to talk about youth unemployment. I'm happy to answer any question anybody has. This might be a great moment to talk about some of those issues. Yes, sir. You, you are with whom? I'm with WBEZ out of Chicago, hey. NPR. How, what is your message to folks in like uh, industrial areas like Northwest Indiana, whose policies under President Trump are clearly benefiting, at least with the steel industry? Really, I'm not aware that Donald Trump's policies are benefiting Gary in the end. <laughs> uh, what I am aware of is that the budget that he introduced would cut Medicaid by a trillion and a half dollars over a 10 year period. Doctors, what would a cut in Medicaid of a trillion and a half dollars do to healthcare in Gary? It'd be a disaster, would it not? Two thirds of nursing home care comes from Medicaid. Cut Medi Medicare by over $800 billion. Try to throw 32 million people off of the health insurance they currently have. No, so I don't believe, I think that what is happening now is the very rich are doing phenomenally well. I think the middle class continues to struggle. And I think what we're seeing here in Gary is not unreflective of what's going on in many, many other parts uh, of the community, of, this, of the country. Sir, yeah. You're in Gary, Indiana. Indiana is a very red state. What do you say to the Trump voters who hear or heard similar things from President Trump Good. on trade, on issues of uh, Good question. wealthy, okay. and trusted him? Good. And let me say this, and I, you know, I've said it before, and it gives me, it really does not give me any pleasure to say this. I have conservative friends, uh, colleagues in the Senate, who I disagree with on every issue. But they're honest people. They believe what they believe. And if you want to run for president or governor or senator or whatever you want to run for, and you say, as Trump's budget just said, hey, I want your vote for A, B, and C reasons. I think we need to cut Medicaid by a trillion and a half dollars. I think we need to cut Medicare by $800 billion. I need, we need to give tax breaks to the rich. And I want you to vote for me based on that principle. And I respect that. If that's what you believe, go for it. What angers me about Donald Trump is that he lied to the people of Indiana and the people of America, all right? He said, in so many words, that he would stand up for the working families of this country, and he would take on the establishment. Well, he ended up appointing more billionaires to his cabinet than any president in American history. Wall Street is doing phenomenally well. Drug prices are continuing to rise. You don't stand up for working families when you try to throw 32 million people off the health insurance that they have. You don't stand up for working families 
Don't stand up for working families when you try to make massive cuts in the food stamp program. You got a problem in this country, in this state, my state. People are struggling to put food on the table for their children. You don't give tax breaks to billionaires and cut nutrition programs like the RIP program for pregnant women and little babies. So I think I can understand why people voted for Trump. I got that. But the sad truth is, and I'm not the first person to say this, we have a president who is a pathological liar. Yeah. And he lies almost every day. I mean, I think the media has documented thousands of lies that he has told, and he lied during the campaign. And he's lawless. That's right. And he's a racist. And a sexist. And a homophobe. And a xenophobe. Look, I mean, I don't want to get into this whole thing. You know, I, let me just conclude. We got to get going. Let me just conclude. Let me just conclude in, in this sense. Look, the country has difficult problems. Nobody is going to solve them all tomorrow. But at the very least, what the function of a president is about is bringing our people together. All right, that yeah. seems to be a basic function. And the truth is that even conservative presidents of all others, remember George W. Bush, I didn't have a lot in common with him. I mean, I don't want to <laughs> deny that. You know, his views were very different. You remember what he did after 9 11? Does anyone remember? What did he do a few days after 9 11? He went to a mosque. Do you remember that? He walked into a mosque to say that criminals, terrorists, attacked the United States, not the Muslim people. All right, that's what he did, a conservative Republican. We now have a president who, for cheap political gain, is trying to divide us up by the color of our skin, by where we were born, by our religion. My God, that is not what a president should do. We can disagree, for God's sakes. That's democracy. But you don't have the president of the United States trying to get us to hate undocumented people. That's right. Yeah! You know, it, it is, that's not what America is supposed to be about. So, Jerry's a welcoming city too, Senator, just good. so you know. All right, let me just say this. I, I want to thank all of Mayor and thank you and, and everybody for organizing this meeting on very short notice. And to tell you that if elected president, we are going to change the priorities of this country. We're going to start focusing on the needs of working people and low-income people. People who have been ignored for too long. So I want to thank all of you for being here and to tell you that Gary will remain in my heart. Thank you. Yeah.